Please look in uh, the book of Ruth in chapter 1, verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited His people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So we know that uh, Abimelech moves his family to Moab. We know the, the history of Moab, but those all three men pass away. Naomi is left. She has her two daughters-in-law. She has Ruth and she has Orpah. Now, as you look at verse uh, 5 of, of these men dying, we don't know why their husbands died. The Bible does not say. But they all, they all gather together and they pack up to go back to Judah, Bethlehem, Judah, where uh, Naomi is from. Notice with me in verse 6. Notice what it says. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law and said that she might return from the country of Moab. Notice this. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. So God's goodness and God's goodness of blessing to his people was even known in a pagan land that didn't have anything to do with God. The message still reached there. That's a beautiful picture of how the gospel can reach anywhere and reach any people. And the goodness of God can be expressed to any people. Verse 7. Wherefore she went forth out of that place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way uh, to return unto the land of Judah. So as they're going, how far did they travel before she turned back in verse 8 and said, hey, you, you need to go back to your mother's house. Now I want you to notice in verse 8 the power of influence. The Bible says, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with uh, the dead and with me. What she's trying to do in, in reality is that you're talking about two Moabitist women. Now, they've been married at least 10 years to, their, to, to Naomi's husbands. As you look at the conversation and it goes on, you know that there's some serious spiritual problems uh, in, the, in the area of their worship. But... The question has to linger in our mind, why would Naomi tell these two women, go back to Moab, where really what she's doing is she's turning them away from the way of truth. And she is going to appeal to all of their temporal needs and only mention the Lord in a judgmental way. Now, what does that indicate in the life of Naomi? Well, it indicates to us that there's a high probability that she is very bitter about what has transpired. Though the Bible doesn't use the word bitterness, you can look at the conversation that she tells them, I want you to turn, you need to go back to your mother's house. Yes, I, I, I understand uh, that her mother and, and their family can provi provide for them greatly. And the, the travel from Moab to, to Bethlehem, Judah, certainly might not be very uh, safe for these three women. But Naomi did say something about the Lord in that, that was very kind. Notice the latter part of the verse. The Bible said, And the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. Do you see what she said? You see here it says, it says here, The Lord deal kindly with you, what's the next word? As ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So, from what we look at the text, there's three things that we can speculate here about their kindness. One is this, that the kindness to their husbands in the illness, because you can't be kind to the dead, they're, they're dead. So we look at the kindness to their husbands, maybe the care for the time during the time that they were ill, or maybe they were not ill, maybe it's just a sudden death, we don't know. But really what's... what's obvious and evident in our, in our speculation is they would have great respect for Naomi, but they also had great respect for their husbands. 
You see, as we have dealt, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. One man made this statement. Ruth and Orpah must have been kind and gracious to Naomi in the death of their husbands because God wishes them to be, God to bless them accordingly. This is very important for our own behavior. Look at me in verse 8. The Lord deal kindly with you as. The word as means to be like. So like you have dealt with the dead and you have dealt with me, I, I really want, I, my desire is for you is that the Lord deal kindly with you in the same manner. Now, that ought to perk our ears up that we might want to choose to be kind to people, right? See, the power of influence is the fact that Naomi's trying to get them to turn back to Moab. The problem with that is that's a place of paganism. But then you look at, at her saying, I want the Lord to deal with you kindly as you've dealt with the dead and dealt with me. Isn't it good to know that when you've gone to attend to those that are passing away or dying, that you've been able to be kind by the, by the Spirit of God in you to be kind to them? And that's what we should be. So what do we, what do we learn from the behavior and the comment that Naomi made to them the comment that May, Naomi made to these two daughters, what can we learn from that? In, in times of crisis, we need to be very kind people. And we need to be kind on purpose. See, the statement that is made that she said, the Lord deal kindly with you as, the Bible said, be not deceived, God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. So if you have calm, here's, here's something practical. If you, if you have family conflict now, uh, the, the Bible tells us that, that if someone sinned against us, that you, you forgive them. Well, how many times do you forgive them? Um, over four to 70 times seven, that's a lot. It doesn't mean I trust you, but I, I, I am commanded to forgive you. Do I expect reciprocal behavior back from you? Uh, no, that's, that's not my obligation. Something that we've gone over in the past is never expect reasonable nor spiritual behavior out of a carnal or lost person. Don't even expect it. So when you get it, it's like getting a gift. See, in funerals, we, we face all kinds of difficulties, and I've seen a lot of things in a lot of funerals. I mean, at a deathbed, I was physically attacked. I've had people on the hillside tell me, we don't want your Bible stuff up here, and I'm thinking, well, you invited me. I've, I've, had, I've had people yell at me from the graveside, yelling and screaming and hollering. I've, I've stood at a casket while the two front rows of people are literally duking it out. You say, where's that? All in the church. No, I'm joking. No, no, no. No, it's at funeral homes. People that don't know God. I, why they call a preacher, I, I don't know. But at least I'm able to go there and give the gospel. Those things, listen, look. If there's some conflict in our families that, are, that is there now, when there's a death in the family or there's some crisis, all it's going to do is magnify it. I mean, you're, you're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, somewhere we at least could be somewhat civil. You say, well, I'm being civil, but they're not. Okay, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. If, that's conditional. And some people, it's not possible. So what do you do? You, you, you be kind. You see, then if you look at people that have problems, if you have no character, you, you need to understand that crisis does not build character. Crisis exposes character. So godliness, following truth at all costs, getting up early in the, in the morning, going to work, heading off to back-breaking work and, dis, uh, and, and discipline, uh, that helps to build character. But crisis does not, do, all, all crisis does is make what's evident, what is already there, there. But I thank God in these women's lives, they were very, very kind to Naomi. Now, by the way, when, when someone dies, you know, I, I've, I've, I've had to sit between family members that were feuding. I, I won't do that anymore. I'm, you, behave. Just be nice, behave. I, I think for a, a brief time that you can sit with each other uh, to, uh, to a point that won't, it won't be that bad. And I'm not talking about anybody in here, by the way. Uh, but but what, what I am saying is that we need to exercise 
kindness. And all this stuff that people fight over when someone passes away, you're not going to take it with you either. The Bible said in 1 Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain uh, we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment therewith, uh, 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 I'm sorry, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So Naomi's desire was an understood, heartfelt desire for these two women. See, but notice what it says here in verse 9. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Now, as she's saying this, what is she telling them about the future? She's saying, I want you to go on. You see, my dad, from a, my dad's still living. He's 80 years old, and I praise the Lord for it. But my dad, his dad passed away when, when my dad was only like nine years old. And so my dad, he would drive me to work, and, and these are conversations that we'd have. We're driving down the road in a little Volkswagen, 67 Volkswagen, and uh, he'd say, or whatever it was, and he, he would say to me, um, hey, now listen, if I pass away, you, you go to the funeral, but the next day you got to go to school. And if I pass away when you're older, the next day what I want you, I'm, I'm, I'm knee-high to a grasshopper, man. We're driving down the road, he says to me, Lee, now listen, if you're working and I pass away, life goes on, you got to go back to work. Don't sit around and mope, I'm, I'm saved, I'm in heaven. So I'm going to be okay, so you just, you just got to pick up and go. And that's what we have to learn. But we also have to teach our, our family how to respond in times of crisis. Now, she says to them, I want you to move on in your life because I want you to find rest in the house of your husband. What is she telling them all I want you to do? I want you to go find another husband. But hang, hang on a minute, man. They're, if, if you're telling them to go back, back to Moab, you've got to be careful. So here's what we have to understand. That's a great thought, and that's a great statement. I know she wants some fine rest. But you and I full well need to know you're not going to find any rest outside Jesus Christ. You're not going to find it in a job. You're not going to find it in a church. You're not going to find it in, in, in relationships. No, what you find rest is in Jesus Christ and everything else is a blessing out of, out of that relationship. The Bible said, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for the Lord only make us meet to dwell in safety. Psalm 29 verse 11 says, the, the, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Look at me at John 14, 27. Rest and peace. John 14, 27, the Bible says, In verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I love what the Bible says in verse 17 and 18. Even the spirit of the truth whom the world cannot see or receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's rest, my friend. Now go back with me to the book of Ruth and let's look at verse 9. So in verse 9, the Lord grant you that you may find rest in each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. So let's contemplate the aspect of witnessing real quick. Look with me, take your time and look with me in verse 15 and notice something that she said. And she said, she's speaking to Ruth, oh, at this time, Oprah is already gone. Behold, thy sister-in-law has go back, gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Telling them to go back to their gods. So these women have been married to these men for 10 years and there's still a problem with idol worship. There's a problem with influence. See, they're both, both Orpha and Ruth 
in, in verse 9, verse 10, look at verse 10. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons of my womb that they may be your husbands? So she tells them again. So what you have is you have the conversation with, with these two women and she's confronting them with really what's an eternal decision. Because we know the, the eternal aspects of, of Ruth and, and Boaz and Obed and Jesse and David and on down through the line of Jesus Christ. So we understand that. But when you look at the conversation between verse 11 to 13, Naomi tries to reason with them, and it's 100% on everything temporal. You do not hear anything eternal. Notice with me in verse 11. We're going to take time to read it. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that you may uh, be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, I should have a husband also tonight, should I also bear or should also bear sons? Would you tear for them till they are grown? Would you stay for them having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth, notice what she says, for it grieveth in me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, I, want, I, if, I don't know if you take notes, but if you take notes, I want you to just mark where she said, me grieveth me, grieveth me much. Now, look on me at verse 14 and 15. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah uh, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-laws go back unto thy people and unto their gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. So it still leaves the question lingering, why would you do that? So what do we learn from this tonight? Well, simply be kind in time of crisis. But we need to prepare our children and our families for crisis. Do, do you know that it, that it is imperative that we make sure as husbands that we have enough life insurance policy that if we pass away, that our wives, our funerals are taken care of, our homes are taken care of, that she has... I just, I've had one person tell me, why, why would I want to live rich then when she's... I, who's talking about rich? Man, when you have a mortgage, you've got to pay the mortgage off. You know, the creditors don't care where your wife lives. They don't care at all. Yes? So we have a responsibility to be kind to our loved ones to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, life insurance to take care of them. We also need to prepare our children for death. Some people get all upset. Well, you, what do you mean you bring kids? No, children need to understand what transpires, that the fact that, what, what, what do they say, that uh, dying is a much part of, uh, of, of life as living? We're all going to die. Without the rapture occurring in our personal lifetime, we are going to pass away. The death rate in this room is absolutely 100%. 100%. It's coming. It's a matter of time. But our response to one another needs to be very kind. Now, I want to mention something to you just as a side note. And I want to leave you with this question. All these times that, that Naomi says to these girls, turn back, turn back. And in verse 15, look at the verse. Thy sister-in-law has gone back unto two things, her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Listen, why in the world, why in the world would she ask that? Why, why would she even suggest that? I think it's a lingering question that hangs with me. And why such urging for them to return to paganism? Why such encouragement to try to get them to go back to Moab? Why encourage these two young women? I believe they are very young women. Why would you encourage these two young women to go back 
to that which would lead to their doom. Do, do we know that Orpha ever came into a relationship with the Lord? No. We may be surprised when we get to heaven, but what we see is the promotion, the promotion, the promotion. Turn back, turn back, turn back. And Ruth and Orpha both are confronted with the decision. I go back there, or I go, back, I'll, I'll go forward here by faith. That's the decision. Why in the world would a Christian parent promote? I'm, I, listen, I'm talking about promotion. Promotion of things that you know full well will not give your child rest. And absolutely 100% will ultimately lead to not only their doom, but the doom of your descendants. Why would you promote that? See, why encourage them to that? And I guess the thought is this. It's perplexing, isn't it? Why would she do that? Well, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to do this. I'm going to ask Brother Brian to turn the, turn the, uh, the, the recorder off, and I'm, I want to show you something.